Is Donald Trump shifting on mass deportation? If they came from a certain country, they're going to be brought back to that country. Mm -hmm. That's the way it's supposed to be. To be determined. Are you really rethinking your mass deportation strategy? No, I'm not flip-flopping. We'll go one-on-one -on -one with Trump's national spokesperson, Haley Bumgardner, and with Congress gridlocked and our nation divided, in our humor segment, we debate what went wrong in the courtroom of Judge Marissa. Mr. Patrick may be a bit confused. Oh, I object lack of personal knowledge. I object incompetent. Objection Stop vague. This. Objection. You're going back and forth like children. Look at the evidence. You're both sounding like Congress. This is Money, Power, and Politics. So Trump is coming back to Tampa Bay as he faces more questions over his immigration policy. He took off, remember, in the primaries by saying that all undocumented immigrants have to go. You're going to have a massive deportation force? You're going to have a deportation force. But after meeting with his Hispanic Advisory Council, sources told BuzzFeed that Trump reversed himself and is now open to legalization. And when asked if Trump still wants that deportation force, as he described in the primaries, his new campaign manager said TBD to be determined. So three big questions. Is Trump really softening his position on deportation? Is he really open to allowing some illegal immigrants to stay here? And will he elaborate on this when he speaks tomorrow in Tampa? Well, I caught up with Trump's national spokeswoman, Haley Baumgartner, this afternoon. Is he or is he not softening his position as it relates to deporting all the people living here illegally? Uh, his position has not changed. Again, uh, the immigration uh, issue has been a forefront of his candidacy from the beginning, and he wants stricter policies uh, that are enforced in terms of our illegal immigration pro uh, problem. It is inequi inequitable for current American citizens, hardworking American citizens, uh, to have to support and prop up people who are in our country taking our jobs and getting our benefits that shouldn't be. So there's been no change to his stance on that policy. So to be clear, he still favors and would move toward deporting all people living here illegally if elected president. As it currently is, and as he has stated, uh, he wants the laws enforced. Those laws are already in place. We have Customs and Border Protection and we have ICE. They're not being enforced. Where he is in his policy is saying that we have to address the illegal immigration problem, and we're currently looking at ways of how that will be done specifically. Might that include any possibility that people living here illegally would be allowed to stay? I'm not going to speculate on that. What I am going to reinforce again and echo is his message, his stance. Uh, it is a major problem, not only from an economic standpoint, but from an illegal immigration standpoint. And so we will be looking at that specifically and addressing specific ways as to how we could mitigate that problem. And will he be addressing specifics in Tampa when he speaks here on Wednesday? Uh, I've not seen an advanced copy of his remarks, so we'll all be excited tomorrow when he gets here. To recap, Trump's plan to mass deport all people living here illegally appears to be up in the air, to be determined or a matter of speculation. But Trump and his surrogates say he is not flip-flopping. Are you really rethinking your mass deportation strategy? I just want to follow the law. What I'm doing is following the law. He has moved from saying all people living here illegally need to go to the bad ones living here illegally need to go. The existing laws, the first thing we're going to do if and when I win is we're going to get rid of all of the bad ones. Trump's campaign is also brushing off mixed signals in terms of tone. His campaign manager said that he'll stop hurling personal insults and then Trump himself hurled personal insults at the Morning Joe people two clowns and a not very bright mess, among other things. So in the second half of our show, we'll ask Trump's spokeswoman to address that. And we'll drill into the Zika crisis that is sounding new alarms here in Tampa Bay, while Congress does nothing. But first, we'll take a closer look at why we have a gridlock do-nothing Congress and why President Obama could not unite us as he had hoped. That's tonight's debate. Once again, Charlie Belcher is my sparring partner, and Marissa will hear our arguments in tonight's edition of Judge Marissa. I have never been more hopeful about America's future than I am tonight. A call for unity fell on deaf ears. We need to find our way back to civility. You just be quiet. Well, but you why? be quiet. You don't own me. Do you think politics is dirtier? Rougher and more in your face than ever? Sit down and shut up. If so, who's responsible and what can we change? That's up for debate in our court. You are entering the courtroom of Judge Marissa Lynn. 
Real issues, real political arguments, settled here in our forum. This is Judge Marissa. You both agree that politics has turned nasty. Yes, but Mr. Patrick may be a bit confused. Oh, I object lack of personal knowledge. I object incompetent. I object speculative. I object. He has his own show. I'm only on in the mornings. Objection Stop vague. This. Objection. You're going back and forth like children. Look at the evidence. You're both sounding like Congress. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent object. to revise my remarks object. in support of the object. reform. In the modern health care workforce, I ask unanimous, I ask object. unanimous object. consent to revise object. and extend my remarks. Order. Order. The gentleman will state his objection here. Object. And Mr. Patrick, we've heard you go back and forth like this before. Oh, sure, with, with Charlie and, and me? No, with you and yourself. Just imagine what life would be like object. if we all acted like politicians on both sides of the aisle. I object. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that, that does sound a lot like Congress. And the reason is because there's no more civility. It's you're, you're on this team or you're on this team. You're either with me or against me. What happened to us all just being able to get along? Mr. Patrick, do you honestly think we have not lost civility in politics? Well, not necessarily. If you look back in history, well, I'd like to play a clip from 12 years ago, Governor Zell Miller. I wish we lived in the day where you could challenge a person to a duel. Yeah, and if you go back more than 200 years, our founding fathers settled arguments by shooting rivals in the stomach. Yes, we've had some ugliness lately. We've had, well, trouble this year, certainly on the campaign trail. But I'd like to go back to video from the convention floors back in the 50s and 60s. Take a look at this. I'm sorry to be out of breath, but somebody belted me in the stomach. There's a priest in here, dozens of reporters, and the man who got involved in it all is very calmly smoking a cigarette. Yeah, there was no golden age of politics when they just stuck to issues and held hands and sang country gospel songs together. Objection. Play Exhibit C. Saying the singing senators do count. Yes, yes, but they were exception, and one of those singing senators was Larry Craig, and before he got busted in the airport men's room, he had some pretty nasty things to say about Bill Clinton. Play the exhibit. The American people already know that Bill Clinton is a bad boy, a naughty boy, probably even a nasty, bad, naughty boy. And Your Honor, that is just the start. I'd like to submit that John Quincy Adams colleagues called him a pimp. They called Abraham Lincoln an ape. And in the old days in the Senate, you could literally get spanked. There is precedent for a senator being beaten with a cane here in the Senate. So don't romanticize the politics of yesteryear because the past was not always that civil. But clearly, in modern politics, the tone used to be softer. I'd like to introduce the old Eisenhower ad. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike. Compare that to how people interact with our president today. You do realize that 90% of the domestic terrorist attacks are done by left-wing environmental radicals and not and people like budget. me. What's the difference? It was worse back then. What's the difference? You want to know the truth? Uh, what is the truth? Okay, you want the truth? Uh, just give us the truth right here, right now. You can't handle the truth. I've always wanted to do that in the courtroom, Your Honor. Thank you. Don't really care who wins the argument. Always wanted to do that. He said he didn't care who wins the yeah. argument. I'll take that. You still win. Jack Nichols. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out she can handle the truth. And now it's your turn to render a verdict. Find and like our Facebook page. That's Fox 13's Craig Patrick on Facebook. Do you agree with the judge's decision? Cast your vote as a member of our jury. Coming up, we'll show you why the polls have narrowed this week and what to make of it. And Mike Flannery has a beef with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Plus, we'll break down the Zika crisis as Congress stays on break. Well, if you follow the average of national polls, you may have noticed that it's narrowed a bit this week. Check out the line graph from the real clear politics average of national polls. Over the past two weeks, Trump has gained a little and Clinton has lost a little. I want to explain there's a couple of things going on here to put this in context. First, Hillary Clinton got a double bounce. First, from a strong lineup at the Democratic Convention in July, and then from a string of mistakes by Donald Trump. Well, as that period wears off, you'd expect the race to tighten a little, just as it has in prior election years. And based on history, the race may tighten even a little more by Labor Day this year. 
But in addition to that, there is one poll within that national average that stands out. It's the LA Times survey that has consistently given Trump more support than the other national polls. And we have the new LA Times poll now in the mix showing Trump and Clinton are tied. And of course that will narrow the average in recent days. Of course, you may be wondering what's up with the LA Times poll. Why then does it consistently show Trump doing better than the other surveys? Well, the short answer is that the other polls filter out the undecided voters and the LA Times presses those undecided voters to rank their likelihood of supporting Trump or Clinton and then counts them in one camp or the other. So translation, it uses a different formula and it also suggests that undecided voters may be a little more inclined to vote for Donald Trump when push comes to shove. Of course, Clinton and Trump both have a good deal of baggage. They've ranked as the least popular nominees in modern history. And tonight, Mike Flannery is here to call out both of them in tonight's Flannery Fired Up. Good for Donald Trump getting rid of his disgraceful campaign chairman. The shocking revelations of Paul Manafort's ties to various stooges for Vladimir Putin raised serious questions, none of them good for Trump's embattled campaign. At the end of the week, Trump announced he had accepted Manafort's resignation. Now, Mr. Trump, how about those income tax returns we urged you last week to release? Come on. And while we're following up, sorry, Bill Clinton, Promising to stop collecting foreign and corporate donations to your foundation only if and when your wife Hillary Clinton becomes president is not good enough. We need to see a complete and thorough accounting of all the foundation's donors. A few emails recently made public hint at the conflicts of interest that existed when Mrs. Clinton was Secretary of State. And aides seemed to seek special favors for a Lebanese billionaire a guy who'd given millions of dollars to the Clinton Foundation, a guy who also, by the way, has unsavory connections to some very bad and very bloody people. It is time for the Clintons to come clean, stop collecting that kind of money right now, open the books. I'm political editor Mike Flannery. When Trump comes to Tampa tomorrow, he may face more questions over the Zika crisis, especially since it may no longer be confined to just South Florida, especially since we have an apparent non-travel related case in Pinellas County. And a few days ago, Trump appeared to have brushed off the controversy, saying that our governor probably has it all under control. I would say that it's up to Rick Scott. It depends on what he's looking to do because he really seems to have it under control in Florida. Well, Governor Rick Scott says it is not under control and he needs more action from Washington. And the U.S. Surgeon General told me that if Congress does not take action, a key part in the fight against Zika will come to a halt. And our ability to continue doing mosquito control expanding uh, our efforts on vaccine development, these will all be compromised. That mean that research and development would simply stop if and when the funds run out? Yeah, if the funds run out, we would not be able to continue our efforts to develop a vaccine. And that's a tragedy because we know that a vaccine could be an incredibly important tool in helping us to prevent complications of Zika. If Congress again takes no action, what specifically would be the threat to Florida over say the next six months? We will not be able uh, to work on mosquito control as aggressively as we need to. We will not be able to invest in the development of a vaccine. And we won't be able to uh, possibly ensure that we have the full complement of testing uh, and diagnostic capacity that we will need for the duration uh, of this epidemic. What I don't want to see is for us to uh, you know, mobilize all of our resources right now and do everything we can and then find out in a few months that uh, that we ran out of resources. Uh, that would be that would be tragic. Dr. Murthy, thank you for your time. Coming up, the Zika crisis has triggered more finger pointing on all sides. South Florida's blaming Governor Scott. Scott is blaming Washington and Congress is still missing in action. Well, Governor Scott is taking heat for his response to the Zika crisis. Just last week, we gave him high marks for taking action while Congress is out on break. But Miami Beach's mayor has big problems with the state's response, and Kelly Wright breaks it down. Governor and the health department were not talking to us. A feud is breaking out between the Florida governor and Miami Beach's mayor over the Zika outbreak. 
Miami Beach Mayor Philip Levine is accusing Governor Rick Scott of not taking enough action. But the governor is pushing back. Mayor Levine has not been to any of those events until today. I reached out to Mayor Levine and he unfortunately didn't return my phone call. Miami Beach has been singled out as one of the centers of the Zika outbreak along with the Wynwood neighborhood in Miami where dozens of cases have been reported. Mayor Levine is upset with the governor for not keeping residents informed about the latest cases. Information is important. We know we don't want to ever play around with people's lives. This is very serious stuff. We take it very serious. The governor says he's been active in his outreach campaign as well as mobilizing crews to spray for mosquitoes. I have made sure that I've gone to Congress and asked for money. We, on a daily basis, we put out information for our Department of Health. I've traveled to Miami a number of times to hold roundtables here. The, so everybody's had the opportunity to participate. Meantime, Florida Democrats are saying Congress needs to pass funding now to fight the Zika outbreak, saying it's already impacting tourism in the state. We kept saying it and kept saying it, and Republicans stuck their heads in the sand, and here we are. Again, funding for Zika research could run out this summer, and Congress has been unable to strike a deal because it's been caught up in politics. Coming up, we'll preview Donald Trump's rally in Tampa, take a closer look at his ground game in Florida, and ask why he hurled personal insults after his campaign manager said he would stop. So bet the big story tomorrow will be Donald Trump here in Tampa Bay because he's planning another big rally in Tampa at the fairgrounds tomorrow afternoon. And today, this afternoon, I had a very interesting conversation with his national spokesperson, Haley Baumgartner, who had some thoughts on Trump's tone. Let's start with the tone of the campaign. We seem to be getting some mixed signals from the campaign saying that Trump would not hurl personal insults and he follows it up by hurling some insults at the at the morning Joe people. What's up with the mixed signals? I don't think there's mixed signals. I mean, look, we're very focused on message. Um, he is expanding upon things that he's been talking about on the campaign trail from the onset of his uh, presidential bid, and he has conversations with the American public. So, in effect, brushing off inconsistencies, redirecting to the core message of the campaign. That's where Trump has been the past couple of days. Also, there have been some concerns that the Trump team does not have the ground game in place that it needs in a state of 19 million people like Florida. But she also pushed back on that. Take a look. We have, for example, 30,000 volunteers. That's huge. Uh, just with our voter registration, we have registered 67,000 more voters than the Democrats. 30,000 volunteers in Florida actively engaged doing different things for the campaign. Yes. Closing thoughts, Hillary Clinton spent this day in Hollywood with Justin Timberlake. Her goal is to raise more money concerned about fundraising from the Trump campaign. That's our show tonight. We will see you once again tomorrow night.